Thanks, Matt, for that introduction, and thank you all for coming today. Um, talk a little bit about my PhD research in whitetail deer ecology, and uh, hopefully it doesn't get too deep into the methods, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time at least discussing the methods we use for our survival analysis, because it differs from most traditional survival analysis, and I wanted to explain that in a little bit more depth, but at the same time, hopefully give some information as far as kind of going survival. Um, today, just going to be talking about the results of survival for white-tailed deer during the hunting season, but I also have some analysis that I looked at for survival outside the hunting season that would be more related to predation, overwinter, starvation, and various factors, essentially killing deer in the winter time. So if there's some questions at the end, I'd be happy to slide forward a, a few slides and show some results from that as well. I know. Wolves are a hot topic in Wisconsin, so looked at some predation rates as far as um, our radio collar deer in the northern forest study region. So as I mentioned today, I'll be talking about trends in white deer survival. This was a joint project between the Wisconsin DNR and the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I got my PhD degree, <coughs> just finished that uh, about three months ago. So recently completed the project. We finished capture in 2014, and our last season of data collection was the hunting season. 2014. My advisor at the University of Wisconsin was Tim Van Dielen. He was uh, pretty helpful with the modeling, but also Dennis Heisey was, was quite helpful. And he's the main reason why I have some of these different models or these variants from maybe traditional survival models. He really advocated some approaches, kind of pushing the envelope as far as looking at survival analysis, made things quite challenging and difficult to explain, as you'll see in a little bit, but hopefully some utility in those methods as well. Um, also, w right now with the Wisconsin DNR was Jen Stenglein and Dan Storm that helped quite a bit with the data collection and the modeling. It was a huge capture effort over four years capturing adults and fawn white-tailed deer. I'll get into some of the capture results, but um, a lot of stories. I probably could spend the entire 40 minutes today um, just talking about capture techniques and, and trial and error and various things that we found as far as trying to get some of these critters captured and radio collared. So um, what I'd like to start off with with this slide is kind of illustrate with these images. These are all pretty clear cut cases where you can tell exactly what killed the animal. One of the goals of the research was to estimate cause specific mortality. So for instance, you have a deer vehicle collision. You maybe have an arrow wound here right through the heart. It's pretty clear how these animals died. However, there's some cases, I'll get to the pictures in a little bit, where it's really challenging. And most of these ideas I had spawned out of Penn State and it was Dennis Eisen that really helped me out in thinking about some modeling approaches to accommodate that uncertainty. Also point out, before I get into the presentation here, the Wildlife Restoration Pittman-Robertson Act was um, supporting most of the research, the funding for the research, and that being a, a joint effort with UW and the DNR. Let's see, you do it's a guy back there. Doesn't seem to be working. Let's see. There we go. All right. So just a little background um, on the justification for why this project came about. I just hit that a little bit harder. I'm not sure. Put the battery. Go. All right. <coughs> So the research, as I mentioned, it started in 2011, but um, it's kind of, if you understand the population trajectories of deer in Wisconsin over the last 40 or so years, you can kind of gain a picture or a sense as to what um, was the purpose for initiating the research in 2011. So these progressively increasing populations from roughly the 1970s and even before that through the turn of the century. So right around the turn of the century, we're all time high deer densities in Wisconsin. It was pretty clear even a lot of the stakeholders, including the hunters, all agreed that there was maybe uh, deer abundances that exceeded not only the ecological but also the social carrying capacity across much of the state. So that's right around 2000. This group called Deer 2000 formed and they were primarily responsible as a group of stakeholders and DNR employees that um, were trying to recommend what should be done with the deer herd and maybe propose some um, actions that should be taken in regards to maybe slowing the population growth and reducing deer densities across much of Wisconsin. So red line here would represent uh, 
eastern farmland region of Wisconsin. The blue line represents the northern forest. So you can see right away in 2000 when they took some of these more aggressive management strategies, essentially just increasing antlerless deer harvest allocation, there was a quick decline after in the northern forest, much lower population growth there, more severe winters. So harvest could quickly limit the population growth, whereas in that eastern farmland, you didn't see much going on until about 2004, 2005, at which time they were able to implement Ernebuck, which was a recommendation out of that tier, Deer 2000 group. Uh, Tim's published a paper by my advisor at Wisconsin that Ernebuck being one of the only real effective management tools for reducing deer abundance in a highly productive landscape such as East Central farmland region of Wisconsin. So you can see a, a response after that. Deer populations started to decline 2005 in the eastern farmland and they're similarly declining in the northern forest. As with any game species, if you reduce abundance, you're going to get a lot of kickback, especially from the hunters. They're going to be concerned. They're going to have expectations that the state should manage at the levels where they experience the highest opportunities. So I'm sure many of you may be well aware of some of the controversy in Wisconsin. Uh, 2006, an external panel was hired to come in and evaluate methods used to estimate abundance because there was concern that they were over-harvesting deer. I'm sure you've all heard that the DNR has gone out and they've killed all the deer, things of that nature. So and the first thing that's the easiest to attack or to criticize is the population estimate, not necessarily the population goal. This entire time, population goals in both the northern forest and eastern farmland were way down here. So chronically in excess of population goals that were mostly based on ecology, but also social carrying capacity. So you can see perhaps getting a little bit closer back to, to levels maybe during the 1970s that would be more ecologically sustainable and better for forest regeneration, especially in northern forest of Wisconsin. So this uh, distrust and this controversy continued through the latter part of the first decade in the 21st century till 2008, 2009. In addition to having lower deer densities, these were all time low antler deer harvest, at least in recent memory, probably back till about the you know, last 20 years or so. So people got really concerned over these back-to-back -back poor hunting conditions mixed with um, lower abundance. So this is kind of where the controversy boiled over. It's interesting, I was actually at Penn State at the time, driving back to Minnesota through Wisconsin, and I think it was the day after the gun deer opener and heard on the radio, it was just blowing up. People were really concerned over there essentially being no deer left in Wisconsin and the DNR has really ruined things. So at that time, usually when there's some issues, you'll have uh, maybe some support for doing some more research, which I was fortunate enough to be a part of. So the research project was initiated. It was actually recommended with that Deer 2000 committee as well as um, the group that came in in 2006 to evaluate the sex age kill model, which was used to estimate abundance. So a radio telemetry research project. Why is that important for trying to evaluate the population size? Well, in Wisconsin, the sex age kill model that's used in many other models, primarily they're using harvest data in Wisconsin. And so what you've got to do is you've got to tie the harvest, which is this thin blue line, to the population. So I've scaled the harvest up just so it matches closely. And you can see there's somewhat of a close correlation there, but um, the modeling efforts are trying to correct for maybe differences when there's not a perfect correlation for instance, from here to here and here to here, where maybe there's hunting conditions or something going on. But we never had any empirical data in Wisconsin to actually detect if the harvest rates were changing or is actually a function of the population changing. So this is where the importance of having these radio collared deer comes in and trying to evaluate factors that could influence harvest rates. So the two study areas we looked at, um, as I've mentioned earlier, those population trajectories were actually accumulated populations from three deer management units representing the northern forest of Wisconsin and the eastern farmland region. I mentioned briefly, highly productive area eastern farmland, really high deer densities, high population growth rates. Um, antler growth rates are really high compared to the northern forest, which becomes quite important, which I'll get to with the results. Mm -hmm. um, and then that northern forest, kind of a cool study area where you've got a Lots of wolves, you've got lots of bears, bobcats, uh, high density and diversity of predators relative to the eastern farmland, lots of public land, so kind of changing the dynamics, hoping to infer something about areas that could represent good proportions of Wisconsin. So we'd go out, radio collar the white-tailed deer over these four years, and then 
we have these really powerful data, known fates data, where we can essentially continuously monitor the animal any time of the day we can go out and investigate whether this animal is alive or dead. As I mentioned in that title site, the challenge comes in when you get to here, if you're wanting to estimate cause-specific mortality, if you find a carcass that's consumed and you can maybe see some wolf tracks and coyote tracks in the snow, you can't really tell whether that animal starved to death. A lot of times these mortalities occur late winter, severely compromised animals from what we can gain that's left there, whether it be bone marrow or looking at some other characteristics. So it's difficult to tell scavenging from predation, and those are two obviously really important factors if you want to figure out the impact that wolves are having. Sometimes it's even worse, especially during the hunting season, you may just find a collar laying in the woods. We found this a lot in Pennsylvania, obviously no wolves over there, so it was generally the concern I had over there was we were getting 10 to 15 percent of our collars found laying in the woods, and then maybe another 10 percent of the collars would go missing during the opener of the gun season. So. Obviously something's going on there, those deer likely aren't alive anymore. But the question is, is how did they die? Did someone just remove the collar and did they legally report the deer, which would be that that deer was harvested, subsequently would show up in the harvest estimate or the harvest count that they have in Wisconsin or had. In that case, then you can look at that harvest rate. Alternatively, if that deer is poached and was never brought to a check station, that's not included in the harvest rate calculation. So we needed to to determine the difference between those two. And we oftentimes had some information at the site, for instance, maybe leaning more towards it could have been legally harvested versus poached, but we weren't quite sure. So the options are to say, you guess one, one or the other cause every time, or you just say it's an unknown. Either way, you're going to introduce bias into your cause-specific mortality estimate. So here's where I get into the methods a little bit. and. Um, trying to explain maybe how they differ a little bit from traditional, more common methods used in the wildlife literature, specifically uh, known fates model and program mark or uh, generalized linear models that are used to evaluate survival. These are very similar to them, but they're kind of spawned out of a, a different survival type analysis, mainly from the biostatistical literature, looking at cancer rates or mortality rates in humans and looking at maybe efficacy of various drug treatments. So these are called hazard-based approaches. A hazard is really nice, and I'll try to get into details of, of why it's nice working with a hazard. But specifically, what we're looking at is the first thing is conditional survival or mortality. So we go out and we capture deer at one and a half years old. We don't want to make any inference towards what happened from birth to one and a half years old, because obviously animals are dying that are never available to capture at that point in time. So we need to condition survival on the fact that if the animal was alive at A, what is the probability of it surviving to time B, which would be maybe one year in this example. And we want to estimate this hazard. So if you look at this function, it's usually going to probably vary even more than that. You can think of even within a day, the hazard may increase in the evening when deer are moving around more, it may increase overnight if predators are more active at that time. So the hazard's this continuous function through time and it's bouncing around, but we don't have the information or the data to model that exactly. So what we need to do is we need to, it's generally termed interval sensor data, we estimate hazards at some interval. The idea is, is that over that interval, you try to make it as small as possible, in this case not very small being a year, and you assume that the, the hazard is linear over that interval. If you have a linear hazard over the interval, what we want to do is get the area under this curve. So we don't really care about the fluctuations within that interval. We just want to essentially get a mean. So if we take the midpoint of that linear hazard, we multiply it by the time of the interval, so just essentially the height of this rectangle multiplied by the length, we can get this area under the curve. And that's exactly what we do. We estimate this parameter, this cumulative hazard here, represented by the area under the curve. The bigger the area, the more the hazard is, the more likely that deer is to die during the year, or deer representing that cohort. So this would be an example of a, of a lower hazard here, again, thinking about it just in this discrete form, kind of this interval sensor data from maybe not knowing exactly when the deer died, but you know it died within the year. So how do we translate to the important parameter survival? Well, you raise Euler's number here to the negative cumulative hazard, and that just gives you the probability of survival. So pretty straightforward there. Uh, if that's 0.9, you have a 90% chance of surviving the year. And hazards are really nice because they're linear. So you can't really compare a let's say a 80% survival rate with a 40% survival rate, because is that a bigger difference than a 
8% survival rate versus a 4% survival rate. They're both double, but one's only 4% difference, one's 40%. Having it on this scale, the log scale, we can compare them more linearly. So we could say in this example, we've got twice the area for bucks. The hazard ratio for bucks to does would be two. So this is a nice linear comparison we have for hazards. So that's one nice quality of hazards. Another thing I'll point out here is I'll go back and forth between mortality and survival. That's just because they're the complement of one another. And that's exactly how I structured the, uh, the model here for modeling these data. So the event data come in, you radio collar that deer, it either dies or survives during the year. That's given a one or a zero. And it's a complement because it's a mortality, it's given a one if it dies. And for those of you familiar with generalized linear models, this is starting to look like a complementary log-log link for binary regression. That's exactly what we have if we take the log of the cumulative hazard, which I'll get to next. But right now, I'm just quickly touching on this random interval effect. And that's important for the methods we use to fit these models, primarily using MCMC sampling and a Bayesian inference. Why are these random effects important? Well. We've got these intervals. We don't really want to estimate a cumulative hazard for the whole year. We want to get that as fine a scale as possible. But if we have limited sample sizes, things can be problematic if we only have two deer radio collared here or we have very few mortality events during, occurring during some of these intervals. So what a random effect does is it just smooths across these intervals. So if we have very little information in one of these intervals, it's going to take the mean across all of them and shrink towards that mean. It's, not, it, it, it's a st essentially sharing information, and it doesn't in a statistical way of saying, if you have more information in one interval and it's different than the mean, it's going to stay away from the mean. And alternatively, if you have less, it goes and shrinks more towards the mean. So this is, in essence, a, a philosophical Bayesian approach whenever you're using a random effect, which I won't get into too many of the details of that, but that's essentially why I chose to use this approach. And, trying to estimate those hazards on the finest scale possible, but realizing that's going to be smooth based on the amount of data that we have and hopefully what's going on biologically thr through the year. So a good example would be this would be January, February, March, April. You get a really high hazard in April if these are monthly intervals. So the other nice thing, like I said, this is looking like a generalized linear model. A generalized linear model basically means we can map these ones and zeros and then essentially treat them as they're uh, normally distributed from negative infinity to infinity. We just take the log of the cumulative hazard and we can look at these linear models. That's really important because if we want to compare hazards among groups, such as I did in the example for males to females, you would just have a, a beta parameter estimate made it here and you'd have an index here of a one if it's a male, a zero if it's a female. So you estimate that contrast that would be your exact hazard ratio right there. And we can look at, okay, does hazard vary across space or time or group and just have these contrast parameters or also include any temporal, spatial covariates. We have information on individual deer, where they are. How does mortality vary through the year or by individual deer? So this uh, Mortality model, everything I've been talking about right now, and this is very similar to what you would get from a program mark known fates type model. The problem with this is there's some challenges when you want to estimate just a single cause of mortality. So we have to do something with this cumulative hazard. We have to partition it up. So the second part is maybe think about that cumulative hazard as a pizza here. And then we have a, an, another model. We have a, a joint likelihood here where this is our first model. And the second model basically says if we have 100 deer that are available and 10 die through that interval there to estimate that cumulative hazard. Of those 10 deer that die, we need to look at these multinomial probabilities to essentially slice up that cumulative hazard. So five die from cause one, two die from cause two, three die from cause three, you would get these probabilities associated with that. And then you go back, you multiply that by the cumulative hazard, again, being kind of on that linear scale you can partition that up and translate it into a cause-specific mortality probability. And just quickly showing the likelihood here, cause come in for each deer, uh, each one of those 10 deer is a one, two, or three. So this is exactly the challenge I was talking about in traditional analysis. You have to specify an integer for cause of either cause one may be predation, two may be starvation, three is other causes. So what happens if you find one of those carcasses where the deer is consumed by a predator, but you can't tell if it was killed by a predator. What you'd like to do is ideally say maybe there was an 80% chance this deer was killed by a wolf, 20% chance this deer starved. 
So in this framework, we can't do that, but being that we're in this Bayesian approach with the MC, MC samples, we're essentially going through and, and proposing a value every time for maybe a thousand iterations. We can do that and we can augment data here in that rather than the data coming in a one, two, or three as a cause, the data comes in as just a vector of probabilities for each cause. So if it's simple and a wolf kills a deer, it's a one, zero, zero. If it's that 80, 20 example I'd have, it'd be a 0.8 for the first cause. It'd be a point two for the second cause and zero for the third cause. So you, if you think about this MCMC MC sampler, every time it proposes a value, maybe you have a, a hundred iterations, about 80 of those, it would say the cause was wolf, 20 it would say the cause was starvation. And then it accounts for that, I guess, uh, uncertainty you have in a cause as well as the fact that it could be various causes and you remove that unknown category completely. So just a quick proof of that and then I promise we'll mostly be done with the methods. Um, these are posterior distributions and they're essentially showing the, the likelihood on the y-axis for each one of these parameters. This is that same example, 20, 30, 50, they sum to 1. If we treated all those causes, and let's say we have 50 events in this example, with certainty, they're up here and the, the higher and the skinnier this bell curve is essentially saying the higher confidence we have in that parameter estimate. And then, as we would expect, with 20% of those causes introduce some uncertainty, you see that variance increasing by this bell curve lowering and getting wider out. Similarly, if 80%, even less certainty. So kind of in a sense showing a, a proof of the concept that it is doing what we expect it to do. So just a quick summary with this approach. We're able to regularize among those intervals, which is a really flexible way, almost in a sense could be thought of as somewhat of like a semi-parametric approach where you, it's not an all or one where you say survival is constant or survival intervals survival varies independently among intervals. We can estimate cause-specific mortality accurately without having any bias. We can model these probabilities with temporal or individual covariates. And then finally, the extension of this model, accounting for that uncertainty, um, allows flexibility in determining the, the fate, removes the unknown category, and then appears to be accounting for the increase in variance. So moving into some of the results, um, from those four years, Huge effort, um, probably hired over 60 technicians across those four years to trap deer during the winter and into the spring for three of them searching for fawns. We're able to capture and handle a huge amount of deer. Over 2,000 animals were handled, over 1,000 were radio collared. So this was the nicest part about the research. Even though it was only four years, we had these huge sample sizes so we can start to detect trends within a year, which I'll get into with our results looking at some really interesting trends as a result of the hunting season and especially differences between the two study areas. A lot of events, um, power is primarily determined by the number of events you have in these types of studies. So having about 400 events from 1,000 animals is really good as opposed to maybe only 10 or 20 dying. Our distribution across those two study areas, as I said, a lot more predators, basically the north woods of Wisconsin compared to the eastern farmland, which maybe isn't as high a proportion of ag as in Iowa here, but um, a pretty good amount of ag, um, really productive habitat, but also a lot of good hiding cover wet um, across the area, so you get a lot of river corridors where you have really good, good habitat for the deer, a, a good mix and, and some really high antler growth and, and high nutrient quality in the vegetation there. So as I mentioned today, I'll just get into the results talking about hunting season survival and we partitioned that slicing up the pizza again into mortality related to harvest and all other causes. So that non-harvest is going to include poaching, deer vehicle collisions, maybe predation events that occur. But this is just during the hunting season, so from September to the beginning of January. So deer are in pretty good condition. As you would expect, most of them are going to be dying from hunting during that time of year. Survival outside the hunting season, again, I don't think I'll have much time to talk about that, but if there are any questions, I can maybe scroll forward to some slides. We looked at that, just overall predation, other natural causes, which would be starvation, and other human causes. Um, we do have pred by predator numbers, which is also kind of interesting, but um, didn't look at estimating cause-specific mortality specific to a predator. So as I said, getting into these results from just that hunting season survival, again, it's importance being that if we can estimate this harvest mortality rate, it's complement, or the harvest mortality is essentially equivalent to the harvest rate. 
Um, in a harvest-based population model, you simply divide the harvest for that cohort by the harvest rate and you get a pre-hunting season population. It's pretty simple. You can think of it if 100 deer are shot and you know that 50% of deer, 50% of the deer before the hunting season were shot, you just divide 100 by 50%, you get 200 at the beginning of the season. So comparing harvest mortality and non-harvest mortality, the big questions we had is how do these rates, not overall mortality as well as the cause specific rates vary among years as well as how do they vary among age classes. This is where the antler growth comes in to be important. Young of the year bucks generally have antlers like this, maybe little forked antlers or really small eight pointers, whereas your two and a half year olds and older are going to be more of your trophy quality deer, especially in the eastern farmland region. And um, we felt we had the power to detect differences between these two age classes. Plus for live deer, it becomes quite difficult to age them beyond two and a half years old. Um, so the big thing was, is our harvest age structure representative of the population? Because if that's the case, um, it's good for these population models. Alternatively, if hunters are targeting those big antlered bucks, um, there needs to be some correction to account for a bias in the harvest age structure. So the results, as I said, here I'm just showing those cumulative interval hazards. Um, so the higher the hazard, the higher the chance of deer dying. This is from September to the beginning of January in the northern forest. I only show one figure here because the uh, model selection criteria suggested that there weren't much differences among years in overall mortality. So this is the pooled estimate from data from 2011 to 2014. For our bucks, that was 246 radio collared bucks. And as you would expect, which I assume is somewhat similar in Iowa, except for maybe the harvest doesn't occur as close to the rut, but a really high risk of mortality during the nine day firearm season. So these intervals are all approximately one week long. You can see a much higher mortality rate or hazard rate in this example during that nine day firearm season. So what we did here is nice part about that regularization or random effects approach is we can partition that out into a really fine scale you can see during the nine day now, we know there's a lot of things that are going on and important things that are going on as far as trying to model variation and mortality during the hunting season. Especially in Wisconsin, we've got a nine day firearm season. Opening two days, that's a Saturday before Thanksgiving, the Sunday, and then goes through and then this is the second weekend. So it captures two weekends and as you'd expect that opening day, we see the highest mortality rate. So quickly just Looking outside the season, I used a random effect to smooth outside the season and then a different random effect inside the season. Not much going on except for, as you'd expect, maybe late October, early November during the peak of the rut. Archers are much more effective at shooting some of these bucks in the northern forest. During the hunting season, one particular thing to look at is not necessarily these first two days where we have the highest hazard, but this third and fourth day. It's really important in the northern forest, maybe more of a camp culture up there. People are going up to camp and if you drive, let's say from Madison to our study area, you're going four hours and even further if you're coming from Milwaukee or Chicago, which a lot of folks are. If you're driving that far, maybe you're more inclined to stay not only Saturday and Sunday, but you make a, a trip of it. You stay Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So this hazard persists to be quite high that following Monday and even a little bit on the following Tuesday. So it's spread out harvest. That's important because if weather conditions are really bad that opening day, it's not going to be as sensitive. It's going to be more robust because people can pick up deer and maybe the weather changes by Monday and it's better hunting conditions. Another thing in that northern forest, you can see I don't have any different estimates by our yearling bucks, the one and a half year olds and two and a half and older. There's no evidence that those differed. So even though hunters might be targeting the bigger bucks, the younger ones might be more naive, moving around more. So those harvest rates and hazards were essentially presumed to be pretty close and, and given decent amount of power, I think it'd be safe to say there's not much difference. And this is a guy shooting maybe a three and a half, four and a half year old buck and he's over the moon in northern Wisconsin. Eastern farmland, that would be a one and a half year old buck and people would probably see quite a few of those and maybe wait till they see a bigger buck. So that's exactly the case here in, in the eastern farmland region. We get different mortality rates during the hunting season specifically higher hazards for our mature bucks compared to the younger ones. Same essential trend outside of the hunting season. You maybe don't see as big of an increase during that rut. If we break that out into nine daily hazards during the, the firearm season, you can see a little bit more what's going on. 
Most importantly, we have, the, again, the highest two hazards the opening two days, that opening weekend, but it drops off significantly that third day. So what's happening here, you have a lot of sensitivity to weather conditions. 2013, we were really lucky, extremely cold opening weekend. I remember sitting in the deer stand and maybe lasting about two hours before you had to go in because it was so cold. Well, that ended up decreasing mortality rates across the entire season just because of the temperature conditions those two days. And we were able to pick that up with our modeling in finding parameters of uh, percent corn harvested and minimum daily temperature to look to have some relationship or at least a correlation with overall mortality during the hunting season. So we're only saying what's going on these two days and we're able to maybe sufficiently model some of this intra and interannual variation and hazards. And that's not the case in the northern forest and again maybe due to that hunting culture up north whereas in the east people are probably not commuting as far only hunting that opening weekend and then maybe being done for the season so now starting to think about these hazards combining them across the year thinking about them um, as far as cause specific mortality goes as I said, we, we didn't have evidence that overall mortality varied. So you get 48%, nearly half of the bucks died during the hunting season in the northern forest. Eastern farmland, about the same rate for our sub-adults, but because hunters are probably targeting those big ones, two-thirds of the bucks dying during the hunting season. So really high mortality rates combined across this period from September to January. Just one year, two-thirds two of the bucks are dying. Look at what's killing them. As you would expect, the easier story to look at is in this northern forest. The vast majority is hunting, and those extremely cold conditions in 2013, we see hazards or mortality rates related to harvest barely decrease. So because I didn't have evidence that the overall hazard varied, we've just got the same. But we did find support that in both study areas, there was some variation among years in cause-specific mortality, so those multinomial probabilities. But as you can see in the northern forest, not nearly as much and just a slight decrease here. Whereas in the eastern farmland, we see a much more, much more variation, specifically that 2013 year. This may be some evidence of uh, compensatory mortality, but we weren't really set up to test that. But if, if harvest mortality during the hunting season, at least we were seeing some compensation here, it would say that overall mortality never changes. If you have a really good hunting season, mortality is here. Other causes are down here. If you have a really bad hunting season, harvest rates go down, but maybe the other causes of mortality go up. So what I was maybe thinking was going on in that eastern farmland, people see deer at a further distance, you're really cold, you maybe want to get out of the stand, you're taking poorer shots, and maybe your non-harvest or your wounding loss mortality increases in that study area, which we did have a, a lot more cases of wounding loss that opening weekend. So in here again, you can see why it's likely that that decrease in temperature in 2013 reduced those harvest rates. So just a quick summary, in that northern forest, things that are good for an aged harvest population model or any harvest-based population model that exclusively re relies on those antler deer harvests, less annual variation in the northern forest, similar between age classes. So you can use that harvest age structure to represent the population age structure. Again, not seeing much variation between those age classes. Here we've got a buck, um, maybe three and a half years old, and I think maybe this slide shows it well. Here he is three and a half years old, the same exact year at four and a half years old, so you almost can't tell the difference in the antlers, whereas at eastern farmland, just one year, a huge difference. So bigger bang for your buck in the east if you're saying, hey, I'm gonna let that deer go, shoot it next year, it's gonna be way bigger, versus up north, a lot more public land too, which may make people more inclined to shoot the first deer they see. So in the eastern farmland, as I mentioned, opening weekend mortality was related to the corn harvest. You have more corn harvest, um, higher probability of dying or being harvested likely, and that relationship to the minimum daily temperature. Comparable harvest rates in 2013 and non-harvest rates, so that was really interesting in that compensation potentially that I was showing you, even though those harvest rates went down, the non-harvest rates went way up and they were almost the same in 2013. And then finally, that higher mortality for our older bucks. So just a quick summary of the, the methods that we used. I, I tried to explain them a little bit. There's a lot of other nuances I kind of glossed over, but the big thing is estimating this cause-specific mortality. 
and maybe some of the only other options that are available are like a Cox proportional hazard, but those aren't going to be able to account for uncertainty. Um, there's sometimes challenges associated with those methods and that uh, they can be somewhat erratic because they're more of a non-parametric or semi-parametric approach. Um, estimating, accurately being able to estimate that cause specific mortality and model that with spatial and or temporal covariates was a, a huge benefit from this approach and, and hopefully making some sense of situations like this where we have just that collar laying in the woods, we have no idea what happened. Like I said, when at Penn State you just kind of have to we had to guess and say, well, that deer was probably harvested and reported. The guy just didn't want to comply and, and uh, call us up on the research end. So with that, um, you saw that, that capture number, those 1,000 radio collared animals, a huge effort. I know there's studies going on here currently and in the past, so I'm sure a lot of you folks appreciate the effort of going out there and tracking animals every single day. Um, we had tons of really awesome techs, more importantly, really good uh, crew leaders that when I was maybe doing more data analysis back in Madison, we could trust them out in the field managing a crew of four or five individuals. And really, the, the volunteers and landowners were unbelievable. Aside from the data collection, we had 1,000 volunteers and landowners, over 1,000, I think the closest estimate would maybe even be closer to 1,500 people that were actually out there in the field helping us collect this information, reporting harvest to us, and they maybe become a little bit more appreciative of what goes into trying to figure out how many deer are out there, and, and hopefully not as critical, and, and just a really good outreach effort. In addition to the, the really good collaboration we had in Wisconsin with a variety of other groups, University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, and, and everyone obviously interested in deer in Wisconsin working together. So I think we should have maybe a few minutes, 10 minutes for questions. I'll ask you a question, Andrew. On, the, on your graph there, we had all those weeks of it and the uh, estimated hazards with the confidence intervals, and then you broke down the hunting season into, like it looked like, just about daily rates. Mm -hmm. So how, what was the end for, for actual events at each one of those bars, roughly? Mm. Not number of deer, but number of events. Well, number of deer and number of events. So this so how many animals died in that first bar, you know, in this particular example? And yeah. The next one and the next one and the next one. In other words, what's the data support for it? So we got about 100 events, and this one with the pooled estimate would maybe be... Um, it must have been in that first day, like, 20 would maybe be a guess. I don't remember completely off the top of my head, but perhaps 20 events across those four years and the 100 events that we experienced, you know, you're going to get, the, as these suggest, the vast majority of calls that come in those opening two days. Um, so yeah, I think about 20 would be. So that's what I was guessing is in any, in any given year, maybe four radio deer were killed the first day or something. Mm -hmm. And then the next year, another four, and the next year, and you've got to have to collapse them. To yeah, and that's exactly could be a challenge if maybe you have independent estimates and you're trying to look for differences in the year at this daily rate, you're not going to have the power maybe to detect that. But if you are maybe looking at this hierarchical approach with that random effect, it's maybe looking at some smoothing among there and, and combining information and saying, okay, do these hazards vary more at the, does the mean vary more and depending on the variance. So maybe it increases power a little bit, but at least gives us more of a subjective or objective way to account for that smoothing within a year. So, I'm sure, you can tell me if I'm wrong, I'm sure that the public was told don't avoid harvesting the, the colored animals. Mm -hmm. But is there a way that you can evaluate whether there was some public bias in avoidance or propensity to harvest the animal? Yeah, that was a big question when we started the actual goal of the research, which looking back getting a thousand animals seems amazing and handling two thousand, but I think the sample sizes 
kind of did the calculations after the fact, which probably wasn't too good of an approach, but they would have been maybe two or three times as high. The goal was to radio collar a bunch of deer and then ear tag a bunch of deer and compare mm -hmm. those estimates. In Pennsylvania, fortunately, right before I left there, they started that same exact type of study, but they put reward ear tags in. So the big problem that even if we did have 10,000 deer ear tagged in Wisconsin, seeing that non-compliance with the collar laying in the woods, it'd be a challenge because you're not getting 100% reporting rate. So in Pennsylvania, put reward tags in, assume that we have 100% reporting rate, and they compared them. The master's student after me, I think she published in maybe the Journal of Wildlife Management, looking at do those rates vary between reward tags and the radio collars and didn't fi find anything. Um, I think you're much less likely to avoid that bias with bucks where hunters are going to, they don't care if the deer is, what the deer looks like, if it's got big antlers, they're going to shoot it. Whereas does, maybe traveling in groups, allowing them to, in that east, especially you saw the picture with like 10 or 20 deers, you may pick and choose there much more. And that's probably why I didn't look as much as, as evaluating harvest rates for does. But they didn't find any difference, um, but that was definitely a goal before the research we actually put out. Um, deer decoys and put fake collars on why didn't the people before me did and, and just looked at it from maybe a human dimension side. Did you see the collar first and then what would you do? Would you shoot it? And there was maybe some evidence, I think that was published as well, some evidence that they would be less inclined to shoot the deer if it had a radio collar. <laughs> um, but again, that's sitting in a blind probably in August when it's warm and just kind of hypothetical, whereas especially that opening day in 2013, if it's freezing cold and you're sitting there and you want to get out of the stand and you see a collar. We went to <coughs> fairly extensive outreach efforts too in putting it in the regs and I think we had a pretty good presence in the study area. People knew of the study. Um, obviously then you could have bias the other way if people are actually targeting the deer. I think that was very much so the case with elk in Pennsylvania but they're more of a herding animal, so there'd literally be stories of guides following the technicians, offering to pay them to give them location information, but in any event with elk, you can tell, okay, they're tracking an elk somewhere out there. The white-tailed deer doesn't really matter. There's white-tailed deer everywhere, but elk in a group, okay, we're going to hunt that area tomorrow. I'll ask you another more technical question. Do, were you able to um, validate your posterior probabilities anyway? I mean, you know, uh, you could start out with a flat briar and so on. I'm sure you did, you know. Uh, um, but eventually you got to, you know, it's, it's data-based. I mean, you know, you're going to get an answer back that uh, divides up the proportions, uh, proportional causes of mortality. Is there any way to validate it? Were you able to do that? How do we know that your estimates are close to truth. Yeah, I, I didn't want to go into too much detail. I figured maybe talking about the hazards a bunch with that might be painful. Um, I showed that one slide where I simulated data and looked at it. Um, there's some more slides where things kind of get hairy, especially when you're talking about the uncertainty. But you ways down here. So for instance here, looking at posteriors with, with simulated data and, and how much information is gained. So this would be an example of you have those three multinomial probabilities and for every single case of those 50 events you don't gain any information. You essentially want to replicate the flat prior on them that you started with. So we started with these uh, a flat prior which doesn't really look flat here but it is because this is 3D so if I scroll forward here this is the prior, this is the posterior in that three-dimensional space and kind of verified it that way. Um, also looking at, you know, if it, it would be what we expected for the overall hazard as well and the priors and sensitivity. There's, I actually just sent an email out yesterday. We, we're looking at some more simulation evaluation of this and the real challenge is when you have a higher probability with every one of these causes. So every time we think there's a 70% probability that a wolf killed it, but there's some slim chance that it could have started in, in 
a smaller chance that it died from some other cause. So you'd expect if you went through maybe 100 iterations, 70 be, would be wolf, 20 would be starvation, 10 would be other. But that's not the case. And, and speaking with Dennis, who understands this stuff much more than me, it's, it's in a sense how we interpret these probabilities and that they're more of these priors that we're bringing in. And if every single time we have the majority of that probability for that cause, the posterior density just shifts all the way onto a single cause. That's something I struggle with. There's another approach where in wind bugs we can do it where we essentially cut it out of the MCMC sampler and then you do get those probabilities, 0 0.7, 0 0.2, and 0 0.1, and I think that becomes more of like a philosophical debate that I don't think I have the statistical background to figure out which would be more appropriate. Well, I think we're almost out of time. Um, I maybe didn't thank you guys as much in the beginning, but it's really awesome getting invited to Iowa State, just moving to town two months ago, hopefully get to come to campus a lot more often and attend some more of these seminars um, and hopefully interact and collaborate with some of the folks here at Iowa State. So really appreciate it and thanks for taking the time to come to the seminar.